So welcome to the second talk of this morning's session. So as usual, please remain muted during the talk. Only unmute yourself to ask questions. If you wish, you may ask questions in the chat. So it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Sergei Gukov from the California Institute of Technology, who will talk about parity, integrability, and logarithmic invariance. Thank you very much for introduction and more importantly, thank you uh, for the invitation and organizing this wonderful meeting. I'll repeat that it's amazing how international it is uh, and it's a great pleasure to, to be part of it. So let me try to share the screen and uh, get going with the talk. Um, right, so, uh, the first part, uh, which will be motivational or introductional and uh, could be considered as elevator pitch, will involve several ingredients, which I'll try to introduce and then hopefully um, shed some light on uh, in the course of the talk. A couple of years ago, I was reading a very nice uh, paper by one of our organizers. And um, the paper actually uh, answers uh, many interesting questions and also poses some very insightful questions like uh, here in the bottom, I quote, why integrable models exist. So it's, it's a fun reading. Um, it also clarifies, for example, the difference between gauge beta correspondence and gauge young Baxter correspondence, something I found very useful in navigating the literature um, in the following years. And um, more importantly uh, for me, the way it's relevant to my talk is it actually talks about interesting questions in lattice integrable models associated with R matrices, which are quite peculiar. So this kind of systems uh, such as chiral Potts model and various uh, close cousins uh, often resist uh, treatment uh, or connection to traditional physics. And uh, this is uh, the class of models, which uh, back then I wasn't uh, really working on. So it was just a fun reading and a good navigational tool to myself. But uh, actually just about that time, um, uh, we were studying some invariants and uh, one of my students uh, was working on our matrix exactly of, of uh, this slightly more exotic type. Um, so this is the work by Sunny Park that was uh, already mentioned, for example, in the previous talk, where uh, he used a um, uh, very uh, interesting instance of uh, our matrix, not the traditional one, uh, to define uh, invariance of three manifolds which take values uh, in a Q series. So it's not terribly important what the details of this R matrix uh, look like. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on it, but some of the salient properties I'll summarize for you here. So first of all, uh, it's associated with a generic Q to a quantum group uh, at a generic Q uh, where Q is inside the unit disk rather than the root of unity, that's already one significant difference. And uh, also in Rishitikin drive and other invariants, we often work with finite dimensional modules. So here we work with infinite dimensional modules of quantum groups. And uh, these modules have generic complex weights. So parameters X and Y could be considered as exponentiated complex weights of uh, such quantum group representations. And um, natural question is, uh, how does this sort of uh, R matrix feed uh, into um, uh, lattice integrable models uh, and other related topics? And part of the difficulty uh, of, of fitting it is precisely the fact that these uh, parameters X and Y are already complex continuous parameters. So that's, that's one of the kind of challenges. Um, Often when, when you want to answer this sort of question, it's natural to ask uh, about uh, the role of spectral parameter, which is a continuous parameter and can be complex or C star valued. And uh, it's kind of similar then to variables X and Y that were used in this R metric. So you can ask, um, first of all, whether X and Y, this continuous complex weights already playing the role of spectral parameter, or if not, shall we uh, introduce yet another variable which would be playing the role of spectral parameter and that question is called bacterization of this R matrix. So I'll try to focus more on this underlying algebraic structure in this talk and it's uh, associated physics but um, just to say a few uh, words about what kind of uh, 
three manifold invariants come out of this uh, construction or where this R matrix is used and what, what it gives, um, perhaps uh, the best way to summarize it is to make a comparison to four manifold invariants uh, that come from instanton counting. So buffer width and partition function over four manifold is uh, a Q series similar to uh, the one that one can obtain using this R matrix for quantum groups at generic Q. Uh, it famously is uh, a character vertex operator algebra. And the same is also true for this uh, three manifold close cousins. That's something that we will discuss uh, later in the talk. And uh, also waffe witten partition function of a four manifold is labeled by additional labels. Uh, physicists call them toothed fluxes. they are elements and homology of the four manifold. And likewise, um, this Q series invariants um, for three manifolds, they're labeled by additional data, uh, which can be viewed as element of H1, first homology of the three manifold, or to be more precise, uh, spin C structure on a three manifold. As I said, these two are isomorphic, but since uh, the isomorphism is not canonical, I personally prefer to refer to them spin C structure, but if you don't like spin C structures, you may think about elements in H1. Either way, this is some additional data that um, uh, the, this, this Q series invariants are labeled by. And again, there are connections to uh, Carl algebras. And uh, I should say that compared to uh, waffe witten partition function, which uh, I only know how to compute for Keller manifolds, this uh, three manifold invariants are much, much easier from the computational standpoint. And by the way, if anyone on this meeting uh, knows how to uh, compute waffe witten invariants for non Keller manifolds, I would be also interested to know completely independently of this. So this is one part of the story or, or a uh, one side of the equation. So, uh, yes. note, yeah, notational qu uh, uh, question on the last slide. What is um, HV? Oh, this is some um, overall power of uh, uh, Waffe Witten um, invariants. Uh, so, they, um, it, uh, here in connection with vertex algebras, you can think of, uh, so if you think about this. Um, ZV uh, invariant of a four manifold as VOA character, then uh, HV is the conformal weight of that uh, module mm. whose character we are comparing to. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's In a sc sc scaling right. dimension, yeah, right. rational number. Mm -hmm. The same is true about the three manifolds. So there are really many, many parallels. And I apologize, I uh, probably won't say too much uh, in the rest of the talk about this three manifold invariants, but uh, I'll mention them in a couple of places and maybe this will hopefully uh, resonate and won't be too, too telegraphic. But yeah, feel free to ask questions at various points. Um, right, so the other uh, part of the equation or side of the story is work of um, Akutsu, Diguchi and Otsuki, which uh, originates in Japan. And this is a very uh, nice pioneering work uh, in published in 92. In fact, this was the very first uh, issue of the Journal of North Theory and its Ramifications. So this is uh, volume one, uh, pretty much when the journal started, uh, I think it was earlier that year or maybe uh, uh, late 91. And uh, they introduced close cousins of uh, Alexander polynomial uh, using um, quantum topology techniques, which on one hand reminded a very much uh, construction of Rishi Tichin to arrive, but on the other hand were quite different. And uh, for each node and for each uh, root of unity, they produce polynomial invariants. Uh, for example, for figure eight, they are shown here, which uh, people these days, including myself and the stock, refer to as ADO invariants. So that's uh, what uh, uh, this, this the talk will be about also, and this is the other side of the equation. And as you can see here in the short snippet from their paper, they refer to work of uh, Jun Murakami. Um, again, also uh, work uh, originating here in Japan, uh, where uh, he did uh, some study prior to uh, this ADO invariance and uh, devoted a lot of his attention later uh, for instance, uh, this is one of the papers already from early 2000s, although again, he worked on the subject for many, many years, where um, he says, I want to 
understand how to formulate this ADO invariance. Uh, this is reference one in, in his paper here in terms of our metrics. And his R metrics is kind of similar to the one that um, I showed you before, except that now Q is a root of unity. So it's uh, even root of unity of order 2n. But uh, the rest is actually very similar to the one we saw earlier, for instance, uh, the highest weights of modules are still generic complex numbers. So same questions that I ask in the case of uh, parks, our metrics uh, apply here. And um, one question is what about uh, its lattice model interpretation, backsterization, all that. And of course, more importantly, how it fits to physics. Uh, this, um, Last question is dear to my heart because I love connecting uh, physics and mathematics as well as uh, many of you here. And this was quite a mystery because although the subject developed for 30 years, uh, there was literally no single paper on ADO invariants or their close cousins for three manifolds until uh, last year, which made any, uh, really any connection to either topological twists of supersymmetric theories or uh, some of the large end dualities or anything related to um, kind of uh, main trends in, in uh, supersymmetric physics or high energy physics. And this was quite surprising given how much connection was established for John's polynomial color, John's polynomial home flea invariance and invariance of three manifolds. So why would this invariance, which seems so close, would be so different? So that's uh, exactly the question that I want to pose and partly answer in, in this talk. So the first observation is that if you take uh, these two R matrices, I think about them as two sides of the equation and uh, one of them was defined a generic Q and had generic highest weights, complex numbers X and Y, and the other was uh, also for generic values of X and Y, but at root of unity. So if you specialize uh, the generic root of uh, Q to two root of unity, you actually get from one R matrix to another R matrix. So uh, this fact was, uh, can be viewed as a starting point of uh, our work uh, with uh, several collaborators uh, last year. Uh, uh, Hiraku Nakajima, Sangyuk Park, Dupay, and Nikita Sapenko, where uh, we basically said that, uh, yes, if our matrices are related, then we expect corresponding invariants of uh, knots, not complements, and three manifolds to be related. And um, we did a very detailed check for knots uh, and not complements. These are these uh, invariants of Akutsu, Diguchi, Onatsuki, and the corresponding three manifold invariants. Um, called CGP invariants after uh, Costantino, Gear, and Petura Mirand. Um, we didn't verify, but uh, of course expected to, to also um, be recoverable from this Q series invariants as Q goes to a root of unity. So this provided uh, basically a first link between, uh, if you wish, uh, physics and BPS states and all kinds of indices and this non-semi-simple logarithmic invariance uh, on, on the right-hand side. So the CGP invariance and ADO invariance are uh, examples of logarithmic invariance um, associated to logarithmic CFTs or uh, non-semi-simple tensor categories, sometimes called logarithmic tensor categories. I guess this term was used by uh, Terry Gannon and, and maybe others for the first time. And um, since uh, the left-hand side, uh, the, the skew series invariants were already uh, known uh, in terms of connection to supersymmetric physics, this basically gave a bridge uh, how, how one can uh, go and connect to, to uh, physics, uh, also this logarithmic or non semi simple invariants. Moreover, uh, it allowed to make concrete predictions for high rank uh, generalizations. I'm not going to talk about it, but uh, since on the left hand side you could replace SU2 by SUN of any rank, and by now it's well studied, it basically allows to give concrete predictions for high rank CGP or ADO invariants. And uh, as far as we checked, uh, there are no calculations, we couldn't find any single paper on high rank um, version of those non-semi-simple invariants. Um, of course, nothing conceptually prevents us from, from uh, exploring them, but um, so far it seems that this has not been studied. So that's an opportunity to, um, uh, to, to walk that bridge. So 
in the rest of this talk, I'll uh, talk a lot about uh, various aspects. And uh, again, it will be just a, a small fraction of everything one can really say about connection between logarithmic uh, invariance, conformal field theories, and supersymmetric physics. So uh, many elements will be uh, in close contact with uh, what Tudor told us. And I'll try to pick topics uh, so that they will be complementary on the one hand, but hopefully such that uh, connections uh, will be reasonably apparent so that one can see that these are different sides of the same very rich and exciting story, which is just beginning to be explored. And uh, here on the slide, I try to summarize uh, some of the relations emphasizing that there will be different kinds of three-dimensional theories. Uh, so I hope it will help to not confuse um, the audience later on. There will be a three-dimensional N equals four theory, which leaves on a generic three-manifold, just like in this three-manifold invariance that we discussed. And in order for it to be defined on a general three-manifold, this 3D N equals four theory has to be topologically twisted. And the other side of the story, the, or the other type of three-dimensional supersymmetric theories that we'll encounter, will have only n equals two supersymmetry, and then will be they will be defined on a rather special background uh, circle cross um, a disk or a cigar geometry, sometimes called D two Q. And uh, this two, uh, the, the, uh, this theory uh, does not. Um, leave on a three manifold directly, but is related to three manifold via 3D, 3D correspondence. So this two 3D theories could be viewed as uh, related by 3D, 3D duality. And uh, here are uh, some of the papers that um, I'll rely on uh, or, or that enter this development. Of course, uh, there is a lot more. And in fact, uh, just by listening to uh, previous uh, talk by Hikami-san, I realized that I should have uh, mentioned that uh, connection to, to uh, his talk here. Um, of course, uh, it would be very last minute change and <laughs> I didn't have time to do it, but there is of course connection not only to Tudor's talk, but uh, also to work of uh, Miranda Cheng, who will, um, uh, to, to her talk, uh, who, uh, so she will focus more on modularity aspects and um, I'll, I'll talk about physics aspects uh, and um, uh, tensor categories as well as uh, uh, logarithmic uh, CFTs. So um, before we uh, leave the world of uh, quantum groups and uh, I already showed you our matrices, uh, perhaps uh, just to clarify, why would we expect such a relation? So I showed you that uh, there are two quite different uh, invariants uh, and um, corresponding algebraic structures, which are related simply by taking Q to root of unity. And uh, from this Q series invariants, uh, one obtains uh, this ADO or CGP invariants. And the natural question is, uh, why not rishi tikhin turayev invariants? which are more, uh, which is probably what we think about uh, when uh, root of unity is mentioned. So let me try to clarify this uh, this point. Suppose we work with a quantum group of SL2 at a generic Q. So that's what it looks like. It's defined by Chevalet generators, E, F, and K, and uh, they satisfy traditional relations, which a generic Q look as such. And if we, uh, take Q to a root of unity, well, first of all, uh, there are uh, several uh, choices how one precisely wants to uh, take the limit. But um, one observation you can make is that uh, from these relations, if uh, Q is uh, a root of unity, then uh, first of all, K to certain power can be set equal to one and uh, E to uh, this power and f to the power can be taken to be vanishing nilpotent. Uh, so this is consistent uh, with the above relations because for instance, k that acts by conjugation on e and f, if repeated uh, p times where p is the order of the root of unity or to be more precise, two p is the order of the root of unity. Then on the right hand side, we get a q to the power two p. And if that's equal to one, then it means that uh, k uh, acts um, 
k to the power 2p <coughs> can be set equal to 1. And uh, similarly for, for the relations involving e and f. So that's, that's fairly easy to see from this defining relations. So what you get in this way is a version of um, quantum group, usually called small quantum group or restricted quantum group. It depends uh, on where you look. Um, so this was introduced by Lustig. And uh, one fun fact about this quantum group is that it's finite dimensional now. So that makes it extremely attractive for any study in representation theory because now it's a finite dimensional algebraic structure. Very, very beautiful. Not only it's finite dimensional, of course, it has uh, also finite dimensional center. That's not too surprising. Uh, what's more interesting is that center is actually um, quite large. In fact, uh, even uh, if we didn't specify, uh, specialize to this finite dimensional version, center would be pretty big. And that's um, another special property of quantum groups at roots of unity. So here in this uh, small quantum group, there is a SL2Z action on the center. And therefore, um, one may ask a question about S and T matrices acting on this uh, space of dimension 3P minus one. Remember that P is related to the order of root of unity. So, this SNT matrices are precisely the SNT matrices of uh, logarithmic vertex algebra called uh, triplet uh, 1 comma p c of t or 1 comma p vertex algebra. And that's the one which has non-semisimple tensor category. So that's the logarithmic or non-semisimple um, algebraic structure that emerges in the most direct way from specializing Q2 root of unity. It contains inside it the Verlinda modular tensor category that's semi-simple, and that's the one which governs representations of WZW model. So that's the one which we use in uh, Rishi Tichin to derive construction of WRT invariants, but that's related to uh, taking Q2 root of unity by an extra step. So if we don't do this extra step, the most natural limit is, in fact, um, taking us to non semi simple or logarithmic invariants. And that you could view as, as a reason why this is, this is um, uh, more natural. So when I first uh, um, encountered logarithmic uh, invariants or logarithmic tensor categories. It was not uh, directly in this context of quantum groups or R matrices that I mentioned. It was actually in the context of uh, supersymmetric physics. In fact, uh, supersymmetric physics of 3D n equals 2 theory. So I'm going to go to this topic next. And what I'll do in the rest of the talk is I'll hop through all of these uh, different corners. So uh, on the one hand, if you're bored with one subject, hopefully it will entertain you in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes by making a turn into a different direction. Uh, but of course, I'm also running the danger of um, not being too focused and <laughs> losing you uh, by, by making those jumps. So uh, back in, uh, um, 2013, which was uh, what, eight years ago, um, with uh, Pavel Putrov and Apijit Gader, we tried to study a rather uh, interesting exotic, uh, at least exotic at that time, combined system of 3D n equals two theories with two dimensional zero two boundary conditions. And um, this kind of problem naturally appears um, if one wants to study how to relate 3D, 3D correspondence to four manifolds. So that was part of our original motivation. And therefore we wanted to understand um, the physics of such systems. Uh, we were quite surprised that um, at the time there was not even a good understanding of physics of two dimensional non-abelian zero two gauge theories. So um, we had to make a tour de force in studying uh, all kinds of um, gauge systems with 2D02 supersymmetry, trying to couple them uh, on a boundary to physics of 3D n equals two theories and uh, so on and so forth. So now this is much better understood subject and um, this kind of indices that I'm going to describe appear um, in many works. So this is just a small sample. And uh, of course uh, the, the list is, is, is very long, but um, this kind of index uh, that, uh, we had to compute and uh, 
first defined uh, was basically a three-dimensional version of elliptic genus. So in two-dimensional zero two uh, theory, one can consider um, a cohomology with respect to supercharge in the right moving sector. That's where zero two has the two and uh, its trace defines for you an elliptic genus of 2D zero two theory. Now, if 2D zero two theory lives on a boundary of 3D n equals two theory, this construction can be extended into a bulk in a way that sometimes is called a topological holomorphic twist of three dimensional theory because it combines, it has one direction which is topological and the other is holomorphic. And a combined system produces for you an analog of elliptic genus, which now depends not just on a two dimensional theory on a boundary, but um, uh, rather on a combination of uh, three-dimensional theory and 2D theory on a boundary. And because of this property, it's already from the start, you could expect that modularity of this elliptic genus is going to be spoiled. It's going to be spoiled by three-dimensional degrees of freedom. If three-dimensional uh, theory is gapped or gappable, then uh, you would expect that it would be a nice modular object as we usually um, have uh, for, for the elliptic genus or character of two-dimensional conformal field theory. But with a non-trivial uh, three-dimensional theory present, um, the modularity of, of uh, this object is going to be modified. And that's precisely the origin of connection to logarithmic theories that will come up next. But before we get there, let me show you basic ingredients. For instance, um, on a boundary, if you want to consider matter multiplet, and there are two kinds called Fermi and zero two chiral multiplets, um, then um, what you get is basically um, a theta function, which here I break in the product of two Pachheimer symbols, Q Pachheimer symbols, and uh, specify contribution of each mode of the Fermi multiplet. Uh, on a two-dimensional boundary. And half of this expression can be viewed as a contribution of a three-dimensional uh, matter multiplet. And 3D, we have only one type of matter multiplet, namely chiral. Uh, so therefore, um, I'll specify both uh, 2D matter and 3D matter basically in parallel, because uh, as you'll see, three dimensional contributions will be always obtained by taking roughly half of the two dimensional contribution. For instance, this is true also for the other type of 2D matter multiplet, namely 0, 2 chiral, which is the inverse theta function. And uh, here again, uh, part of it or half of it uh, is precisely the contribution of 3D n equals to chiral with Neumann boundary conditions. And finally, the third type of multiplet that one usually encounters in this uh, type of two dimensional supersymmetric theories or three dimensional supersymmetric theories is a vector multiplet. And um, if theory is abelian, which is um, all I want to illustrate for now, uh, the contribution to this uh, so-called half index or 2D, 3D elliptic genus is simply the integration over fugacity X, which is associated to the charge of, uh, for example, chiral multiplet on this uh, previous slide. So it's kind of natural, uh, especially in the Sibelian case, because all it does, it basically picks out zeroth power of X, which means physically gauge invariant combinations of operators. So no surprise here. So let's, uh, with what we have learned even uh, in the simple summary, try to produce the simplest uh, theory that could be viewed as basically Ising model uh, type construction. So it's uh, the simplest possible. So here, um, let's take uh, a three dimensional theory with uh, one U1 vector multiplet that produces uh, this constant term uh, dx over x type integral. We'll take two chiral multiplets of charge plus one and minus one. So that's why we get two Pachheimer symbols uh, with x uh, variable and x inverse variable. So x and x inverse refer to, to the charges. And um, here I use this Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions following the rules um, as, as on the previous slides. So, <clears throat> you can run this computation, uh, that's uh, fairly simple. And what you obtain uh, is a so-called fermionic form of a character. And uh, here it is, uh, even in this simplest possible baby example, what we get is a character of a logarithmic vertex algebra. 
Uh, and again, the reason is simply that this two-dimensional zero two theory that lives on a boundary now talks in a non-trivial way to three-dimensional supersymmetric theory. So modularity is affected by the 3D bulk and that's what makes this uh, character algorithm. In this particular case, this is character of a theory which has central charge minus two. It has um, minimal conformal dimension minus one eighth. So C effective is actually equal to one. And uh, in the paper called 3D modularity, we give many more examples of such uh, half indices, trying to relate them to uh, identify them as, as logarithmic theories. So in this present case, uh, this theory, which has uh, central charge minus two and C effective equals to one, was recently uh, proposed to be uh, related to um, lattice model, namely the six vertex model, which is one of the most uh, famous and uh, well studied and well understood models. However, uh, in an in interesting uh, context of um, free fermion limit of this model, where it was proposed that uh, it's related to um, uh, domino tilings are uh, called Aztec tilings. So uh, statistics uh, of uh, this model in this particular limit uh, was suggested in, in these recent papers to be precisely this logarithmic uh, VOA with central charge uh, minus two the, whose character we just encountered. So here I showed you uh, an example of how from 3D supersymmetric theories using this half index type calculations, one can get a Q series, uh, which is a character of logarithmic um, vertex algebra. Uh, one can also obtain um, such uh, Q series expressions, which often turn out to be characters of logarithmic algebras from three manifolds using this R matrix uh, that I showed uh, in the very beginning. And of course, these two uh, 3D theories, uh, supersymmetric and based on three manifolds are not unrelated. These are basically uh, two sides of 3D, 3D correspondence. So uh, perhaps in her talk, Miranda will show you more examples of such specific Q series. But I want to pose actually a question. Um, in many cases, uh, say for three manifolds or this 3D n equals two series, one can easily compute the expression. So one finds a Q series, which looks like this. So here I give examples uh, for, for three manifolds and uh, one can compute this Q series to very high order. Um, for instance, here is an example of a surgery on hyperbolic surgery on figure eight knot or some uh, plus five surgery on uh, 10 crossing knot. And by now one can do a lot of this, but it's actually hard to identify what the corresponding logarithmic theory is. So I don't want to uh, make the simple example that I showed a moment ago misleading. Uh, there we were able to say that it's a very simple uh, logarithmic CFT with central charge minus two, because we actually knew this logarithmic CFT a priori, we knew its characters and we just look at uh, existing literature and check that what we get is exactly the same character. But very uh, few characters of logarithmic CFTs or even very few logarithmic CFTs are known at present. And uh, their study is an extremely interesting, exciting problem. So establishing this dictionary uh, is highly non-trivial. For example, in this case as shown here, I have no idea what logarithmic CFT is. And that's, that's one of the challenges that perhaps Miranda will describe in her talk to some extent. But what you can do um, is you- With a uh, observation on this, a question about the, um, so these Bs are all the uh, elements in uh, H1 of the- yeah, these are the spin C structures, which I briefly mentioned in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. these are Q, right. So one finds Q series invariance valued, uh, labeled, sorry, by spin C structures, correct. Right. And uh, so why are they, um, I don't know what the right, I think it's called palindromic. So there's a repetition that uh, the top one and the bottom one are the same and the second and the second to last are the same and well, the middle. Oh, movement. yeah, that's a good observation, yeah. <laughs> Great job spotting that. So indeed, a B and minus B are related by a symmetry which uh, comes from while group of SL to C. So, so this um, Q series invariants have some origin in SL to C transignments theory. And um, the 
while the two symmetry of, 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 of the SL2C is precisely what relates B and minus B. So in some sense, you always have not, not exactly H1 worth of Q series invariance, but rather H1 divided by Z2. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good you. job spotting that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, you mentioned earlier that there was a holomorphic topological twist for the 3D n equals to 2 theory. And I, I remember that for certain 0 comma 2 theories, you, uh, that you can make contact upon half twisting with uh, the theory of chiral differential operators. So is there a relationship between log VOAs and chiral differential operators? Um, that's a good question. So many log VOAs, of course, so, so chiral differential operators is basically a geometric way of constructing vertex algebras, right? Uh, as, as sections, for example. So some uh, of the logarithmic VOAs can be constructed as CDOs, uh, but I don't know how well uh, studied this is. So this is a great question, or I'd rather say an amazing proposal for <laughs> funding agency to study. I, I hear I advertise the, the question that we don't really have many enough constructions of logarithmic vertex algebras. And what you just suggested is, is a very nice uh, geometric way to do it. So um, I know that there are some steps in the literature. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting uh, the, the right references, but uh, th th there are just initial uh, baby steps. This really needs to, to be developed and perhaps physics can help to find this geometric constructions indeed very much uh, as in the spirit of zero two theories now uh, upgrading them to this uh, half index setup. Yeah, very, very, very good question. Thank you. Yeah. Right, so uh, if you don't know uh, or don't have a table of, of uh, log safety characters so that we can compare, can compare all this wealth of results, so what can we infer from this Q series? After all, we can compute it. And as you see here, up to uh, pretty much any power of Q and so on. Well, one thing that uh, is low hanging fruit is you can quickly see uh, or check the rate of growth of the coefficients. That's, that's uh, relatively doable. And uh, that determines effective central charge. And interestingly, in all examples, um, uh, including uh, this hyperbolic examples and on all nodes uh, and their surgeries that has been checked, it seems that uh, effective central charge is equal to one, at least uh, for, for SU2. And uh, expectation is that maybe that's uh, determining the rank because what I showed you is for SU2 and maybe for SUN it would be N. So that's one natural characteristic or question of this uh, two-dimensional CFT or rather chiral algebra. It's only chiral part of the CFT, which is captured by, uh, by this half index character. So that's, that's an honest question. I have no idea what answer is, but um, I throw it out there for uh, as, as a good question that um, one of you may uh, potentially answer. So again, hopefully Miranda will uh, say uh, a little bit more about the story from a complementary or uh, other perspective, shedding more light on modularity, for instance. And we already, again, heard a closely related discussion in um, talk of Professor Hikami, but uh, I'll move on uh, further on. So, so far I told you a little bit about logarithmic CFTs, quantum groups and their corresponding invariants and tensor categories. Uh, we just discussed 3DN equals two theory. So definitely something that uh, remains here is 3DN equals four story. And that will be my last corner in, in this uh, journey through different uh, islands of, of uh, logarithmicity and its connection to physics. Let me ask a question real quick. Yep. Um, how do you see the growth of the Fourier coefficients? I mean, um, that would depend a lot on what kind of modular properties you have. I mean, the, uh, the uh, maybe on the next slide. How, how do you s spot the um, exponential growth over here? Well, first of all, exponential growth is expected. So, so let me maybe pause to say that at least in the context of this 3D, 3D correspondence um, where we compute this half index for n equals two theory T of M3. Um, 
this exponential growth is expected, but I would say even perhaps more generally with reasonable choice of boundary conditions, simply because I see this topological holomorphic twist is projecting us uh, on a sector which behaves very much like CFT, two-dimensional CFT. So that already is not surprising. This is built into this index, uh, this, this half index. So then the natural question is, so the, the fact that uh, it behaves in this particular way, just like in general 2D CFT is more or less obvious. So that's that's uh, could be viewed as a prediction or expected from physics. So the next question is, how do we compute the C effective? Okay, so we look at this expression. We um, look at the absolute value of the coefficients, say one, two, three, and so on and so forth. Uh, it actually had to be divided by Q infinity, the, the function. And uh, well, anyway, we just expand and plot it in Mathematica and it shows uh, it perfectly fits uh, you know, on this curve. And we just read off the value of C effective. So that's, yeah, that, that's exactly the point. So we, we don't know modularity of, of or uh, for instance, for this 10 crossing knot or some seven, eight crossing knots that one can compute surgeries on, I have no idea what the modular property is. Absolutely not. Not, not even in this case. In fact, in uh, my previous talks, I sometimes would offer a bottle of wine to anyone who would tell what is what this function really is. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we don't know modular properties. Again, uh, I don't know to what extent Miranda will be able to shed light on this. I still offer a bottle of wine who <laughs> can shed light on modularity of either this function or this function, but we know this function. So it's a funny thing where uh, we know this Q series up to, I don't know, a thousand of terms. So um, therefore um, one low hanging fruit is basically to estimate the growth of coefficients. And uh, that's, that's what I pose here as a question, but probably there is a more uh, insightful and careful analysis one can do to actually say something more serious about the modularity properties. Just so that, a follow question on this. Like the end growth properties for the coefficients that you wrote down, it looks a lot like that of a weakly holomorphic modular form. But this ZQ over here does not, I mean, sure, it does have the right um, um, polar term, but uh, does not look like a weakly holomorphic modular form. So is that something surprising to expect? Or you, you've got coefficients that grow like weakly holomorphic, but a function that does not look like weakly holomorphic? Um, I have no idea. I would actually love to know, to know the answer to this question. And uh, if uh, we, we were in the game who wants to be a millionaire, I would actually ask for a lifeline. Uh, I don't know if either Miranda or Sarah are on the call, <laughs> maybe they can be my lifeline. Uh, so. Okay, thanks. But it's a great question. So uh, I, I apologize for not being able to, to answer it. So, right, in the last remaining uh, 15 minutes or uh, part of my talk, I'll go to 3D and equals 4 theory, and this will be last perspective, uh, which will start with something completely different or at least different looking. And then I hope to loop back into um, some of this uh, logarithmic either CFT characters or invariants or Q series invariants that uh, are related to them by, by via quantum groups. So the problem here again looks quite a bit different. So um, you can imagine a three-dimensional n equals four supersymmetric theory, uh, which is a, a, let's say a sigma model with hyperkeller target x. If it's three d n equals four, target x has to be hyperkeller. And um, we were interested in studying uh, Rosansky-Witten invariants uh, associated with. Uh, this data when X is non-compact. When X is compact, uh, this is uh, perfectly well described in the famous paper of Rosansky and Witten, but as uh, they point out there, when X is non-compact, things are delicate and I'll explain, well, at least in par very partly why, and that's precisely the case that we wanted to approach. So one way to cure non-compactness is to uh, try to uh, use localization. So let's assume that our target space X uh, of this three-dimensional n equals four sigma model has uh, U1 action, U1 symmetry. And um, I should say that large supply of such theories uh, comes, for example, from gauge theories where X could be viewed as a Coulomb branch or Higgs branch. Um, 
we, we prefer to look at it as a Coulomb branch, but uh, this does not really matter. In some sense, you can consider a sigma model with hyperkiller target X. That's um, say Hilbert scheme uh, of points on some um, hyperkiller surface uh, as, as your target uh, without even knowing where it comes from. Anyway, uh, then we propose that uh, the behavior of this theory on a generic three manifold, namely this rosansky witten twist, uh, behaves very much as if it's described by a modular tensor category where uh, values, um, matrix elements of T matrix and S matrix are controlled by the geometry of the fixed point of uh, U1 symmetry acting on, on the target X. Namely, uh, if, if you assume for simplicity that uh, fixed points of such U1 action are isolated, related to elements of square root of the canonical class divided by the Euler class of the tangent bundle at that fixed point is related to uh, matrix elements of uh, S transformation. So for instance, uh, if X uh, is a certain Coulomb branch, uh, which has two fixed points, such Coulomb branch naturally comes from uh, four dimensional Arjuris Douglas theory compactified on a circle, you can actually uh, find Fibonacci uh, MTC from uh, these two fixed points. And uh, this is actually something we did a couple of years ago in precursor to, to this work uh, last year. And also something that appears in nice work by um, Dong Minghang and uh, other uh, collaborators uh, from a paper about a year ago. And in fact, for them, it's a precursor of a more recent work that involves Masahito Yamazaki, uh, where they studied um, theories without geometry, without this Higgs or Coulomb branches. So in some sense, they push it uh, to extreme limit, uh, kind of away from, from geometric limit, but I wanna stay within uh, geometry. And um, again, uh, deliver the point that fixed points of uh, this geometric U1 action on, on such Coulomb branches naturally uh, correspond to simple objects uh, or, or cardinality um, of the graph and decreeing of this uh, tensor category. So let's consider a simple example. So let's consider a uh, target uh, T star CP1. So that's a nice hyperkeller manifold. Uh, we all know this as uh, LE space of type A1 resolution of say C2 mod Z2 singularity. And it actually has two U1 actions. So uh, I'll call them U1T and U1X. Uh, I'll comment on this in a second, but more importantly, uh, with respect to this U1 actions, you have only two fixed points, which are north and south pole of CP1. And therefore, just like in this previous example of uh, Fibonacci MTC, you would uh, here naturally have two uh, simple objects and tensor category where uh, its graph and group uh, would be uh, of dimension two. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, this uh, two U1 actions uh, are such that um, they are slightly different. So uh, let's look at it a little bit more carefully. One is uh, holomorphic and one is uh, triholomorphic. So there is only one triholomorphic action and uh, the, the second uh, preserves uh, uh, one uh, complex structure, but no, not all three complex structures. So Therefore, I'm going to distinguish them. They're, they're going to play slightly different role. And this is reasonably well understood in the context of rosansky witten theory. And um, triholomorphic action, uh, I'll denote U1X with the letter X, which uh, should make contact with uh, various other users of letter X in previous parts. And the holomorphic action I'll call U1T. So the reason they're different is that in the context of rosansky witten theory, uh, triholomorphic action on a target can be defined on generic background, on a generic three manifold, in other words, but holomorphic action can be defined only on a cipher type backgrounds of the form Riemann surface cross a circle. And uh, therefore you should think of uh, U1X action as, as the one that you want uh, on a generic manifold, but U1T is something that uh, is still useful and uh, can serve as um, 
good guide at intermediate stages, but perhaps in the end of the day, we want to set t equals to one. So that's um, uh, one, one important remark. Another important remark is that the triholomorphic action in the context of rosansky witten theory, one can quickly show to be related to uh, spin C structures. And uh, this is yet another way to see that uh, uh, in certain instances, one gets invariants labeled by spin C structures on three manifolds. I'll, I'll come back to this uh, a little bit later. Anyway, carrying out with uh, our example T star CP1, which is a simple hyperkeller manifold, uh, we can try to compute this invariant uh, by integrating over the target, which is non compact, so integrals. Uh, such as integral of a roof genus, for example, are ill-defined. But if we use the symmetries, then we can do this integral using equivalent localization. And in that case, one gets uh, contributions of two fixed points, which one can interpret uh, in the case of S1 cross a Riemann surface as basically a Verlinde type formula, for example. Uh, if Riemann surface is a two sphere, then such invariant on S1 cross S2 will be a sum of uh, matrix elements as zero lambda squared. And uh, using expressions that we saw on the previous slide, we can find um, this rational function, rational function of T and X obtained using this equivalent localization uh, for, for target, which is T star CP1 and the three manifold S1 cross S2. Independently, uh, in rosansky witten theory, one can show even from uh, original definitions, and this is uh, what Rosansky and Witten did, that um, uh, for uh, S1 cross S2, this uh, integral over X of uh, a roof genus is basically producing uh, the, the Hilbert series of the target manifold X. So indeed, uh, up to some overall power, uh, there's a rational function here is precisely the Hilbert series of uh, T star CP1 of the, uh, viewed as a complex surface with the corresponding weights. And um, as I pointed out uh, a moment ago, uh, variable X here should be viewed as something that's uh, good for any three manifold and uh, variable associated to spin C structures in the sense that if you take this rational function and expand it in X, then coefficients of different X powers are precisely the values of this invariant for different choices of spin C structure in this case on S1 cross S2. Remember that the set of spin C structures is um, isomorphic though non-canonically to H1 and S1 cross S2 has H1 equals Z, the integers. So even in this simple example, we actually have infinitely many spin C structures, which correspond to coefficients of different powers of X in this rational function expanded in the variable X. So let's take this model, as you can see, even the simple model of uh, rosansky witten theory with target T star CP1 is extremely rich and interesting, but it actually fits in a larger family. So it admits a very simple generalization that um, physicists can describe uh, by a quiver type theory with uh, gauge group UM and uh, a matter in the fundamental representation. Uh, mathematically, this gives rise to a target are now labeled by integer m, uh, which can be presented as a hyperkeller quotient. Very much like uh, T star CP1, which is the case when m is equal to one, this entire family admits uh, two U1 actions, one which is triholomorphic, so I'm going to continue calling this uh, U1x, and one which is holomorphic, so I'm going to continue uh, to, to call this U1t as before. Again, uh, one can try to compute either Hilbert series of this uh, or, or, or uh, a sum of uh, contributions of the fixed points. Either way, one finds an answer, which is now a little bit more interesting, a rational function uh, of X and T generalizing the previous expression. So to summarize, this is a family labeled by integer M. Uh, the first member of the family is exactly T star, T star CP1. And uh, as M goes up, dimension of this family of manifolds, hyperkeller manifolds increase. And um, in general, the hyperkeller dimension goes as M squared. So that's, that's something that's easy to see from this hyperkeller quotient. 
So let's uh, take the limit in this. Uh, if we have the whole family, why, why not take M to infinity? We can uh, do this. So then uh, the answer, at least for the invariant of S1 cross S2 would look something like this as shown on the top of the slide. And um, if we want to formally take uh, a cotangent bundle to, to this uh, manifold X, it was already a nice hyperkeller manifold, but suppose we want to take a tangent bundle, then uh, as often happens in this index calculations, you basically uh, provide a second copy of the answer, perhaps shifted in some uh, R charges or homological degrees. So therefore I take the formula on top of the slide and uh, put the same numerator with slightly shifted coefficients and claim that that's the answer for um, a tangent bundle of, of this X. And the reason I want to consider a tangent bundle is that uh, the limit uh, when M goes to infinity is describing the affine Grassmannian, in this case for SL2, uh, for, for rank one. And uh, therefore the model that has both numerator and denominator should be viewed as, as an answer that corresponds to the tangent bundle to the affine Grassmannian. And the reason cotangent bundle is interesting is that it can be viewed as a moduli space of Higgs bundles, namely the Hitchin moduli space for group G, which in this example is just SU2. So everything I did is for SU2. That's why you see uh, three terms in the numerator and denominator, but where the domain, namely the curve sigma is a formal disk. So in this case, one finds that analog of the Hitchin moduli space is this uh, huge infinite dimensional variety. And we can think of uh, spaces XM or rather T star of XM in the previous uh, slides as finite dimensional approximations to, to this answer. So the reason I'm telling you this is that now we made the full circle uh, to this Q series invariance this particular case for three manifold, which uh, is S1 circle cross a two sphere, S1 cross S2. And this is indeed the correct expression for, for this Q series that had refined um, by variable T because it happens to be of the form S1 cross sigma. There is a way to introduce this refinement, which wouldn't be possible on a general three manifold. Uh, X again is a variable that uh, is responsible for choice of spin C structure. So if we expand this in variable X, we'll obtain a Q series uh, ZB hat of Q. And um, the variable Q itself is uh, associated with loop rotation in the affine Grassmannian. So therefore, um, another result uh, of um, the paper from last year uh, about this logarithmic invariance uh, had a proposal that this Q series invariance Z hat of Q labeled by spin C structures can be interpreted as uh, rosansky witten theory with very unusual target, which roughly speaking is T star of a fine Grossmanian. And in the paper, we go into detail uh, that this needs to be refined and uh, made a little bit more precise. Uh, but um, this relation or this interpretation was, uh, first of all, is something that one can try to check on a general three manifold. And in the paper, we actually discuss the case of lens spaces. Uh, but it's actually quite instrumental in understanding connection with this uh, ADO and uh, CGP invariants uh, were, uh, which can be obtained by taking uh, Q to be, to be a root of unity. So uh, in this talk, I um, showed you some of the intriguing connections between uh, these uh, exciting subjects. And uh, again, um, unlike uh, the situation a year ago, now we uh, have uh, windows uh, and doors open between logarithmic or non-semi-simple invariance and tensor categories, as well as uh, supersymmetric indices, partition functions. And um, again, this connects uh, very naturally to many ingredients of uh, uh, Tudor stock. And I hope you can see some of the connections. Uh, other aspects will be discussed by uh, Miranda in her talk. And um, I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, seeing some of these connections. And of course, I'll be glad to answer any any further questions. Thank you for attention. So let us thank uh, Professor Sergey Gukov for the very nice talk.
questions or comments from anyone, please unmute yourself. In, uh, uh, comments for the previous talk. We are related to BPS indices uh, because uh, both your supersymmetric theories have extended supersymmetry. So uh, BPS indices and central charges. Yeah, so um, this um, Q series invariants are basically. Um, close cousins of uh, um, quantum group invariants uh, such as John's polynomial, but now in the case of uh, three manifolds, so there the, are the, the Q-series invariants of um, three manifolds. And yeah, they can be interpreted as uh, BPS indices. Uh, here in this talk, there were more like supersymmetric indices of 3D theories with other n equals two or n equals four supersymmetry. Um, yeah, the interpretation uh, for in the last part of the talk in terms of rosansky witten theory, perhaps is uh, yet another phase of, of, of this coin or slightly different because their Q um, appears in um, slightly different way. But um, yeah, if, if for example, if one leaves this story to six dimensions and I hope uh, it's uh, reasonably clear how to do it basically by combining S1 cross uh, Sigor cross cross a three manifold, one gets precisely to uh, set up where one can see BPS state interpretation, also connection with uh, Tudor stock. And mm -hmm. from that perspective, whether we talk about quantum groups at uh, generic Q or Q being root of unity simply corresponds to changing the boundary condition at the boundary of the disk. That's, that's all there is. Uh, it was clear from your definition, maybe even that these uh, coefficients would all be uh, integers. Uh, that's right. So physics, uh, of course, wants this and, and predicts it. And uh, the fact that, say, some mathematical constructions based on R matrices um, uh, allow this uh, R matrix of Park produce this sensor. Uh, is, is, is natural physically. Um, I don't know mathematically how uh, obvious it is, to be honest. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a good question. Thank you. Any uh, other questions? May I ask questions? So I'm not so familiar with the same sort of logarithm and topological physics theory. So, so you, you consider some modular data of S and T matrices. And uh, you, in the, your example, you only give us some zeros component of the S matrix. So can we extend it to the poor S matrix, which is, and the T matrix that is buying some SL2 relation? Uh, right, so the, I think there are two questions uh, here. So um, one, one is um, whether given, uh, for example, in, in this uh, last part of the talk, uh, given the geometric data of fixed points uh, of the target X, whether one can determine S mu lambda, not just as zero lambda. Yeah. Uh, I actually uh, don't know the full answer to this question. Uh, in um, this um, last paper from last year, as well as the previous one, um, we discuss um, some instances where this can be done and physically one can in fact try to understand this full um, yeah. category, including its braiding data, because that's another uh, question one can ask uh, in terms of uh, as a category of line operators. But uh, of course, uh, one wants to have a concrete implementation of this uh, statement, not just a general physics expectation. So that's maybe one comment. So I have only partial answer to, to so this question. Let me ask a different question. So if we, in this expression, when take a cake or one, and it corresponds to three sphere, and uh, the usual empty case is three sphere pattern function is uh, equal to S0, zero, zero. And uh, so in this case, so you can, so K or one case, there are two alternative expression using the your expression and uh, another one is just the uh, zeros component S matrices. And uh, do they always match it? 
no, no. So that relates to to your uh, yeah, yeah. To second part of your question. So, uh, like I mentioned, in even in the way you originally asked it, there are two parts. One is how to recover as mu lambda from geometry in a very nice, neat way, analogous to this formula uh, here. Um, so th that I believe can be done because again, there is underlying physics statement that says that the entire data of this tensor category, which in general is not even modular, it's, it's, it's probably BTC rather than MTC. Um, but anyway, there, there is an underlying physical statement. But the second question or second part of your question is what happens if uh, we are in a situation where underlying uh, tensor category is logarithmic? So then that's that's actually more delicate and that's more interesting. That's why you're absolutely right that currently um, there is a lot of work uh, channeled uh, both in physics and math and trying to understand this logarithmic TQFTs. So, so this is a uh, moving target in a sense or developing story and it's just being developed as we speak. So uh, the answer to, to this question is that I can try to summarize some current proposals and structures, and you can view our work as, as uh, hopefully contribution in this direction. But um, more proper answer is that it's it's an exciting story that's still being developed. And of course, um, again, I tried to emphasize earlier that there were contributions from uh, Japanese school, ADO, uh, Murakami-san, and uh, also CGP then uh, contributed a lot and many, many other people. So, so this is very rich story. And um, that, that's uh, something that, uh, again, hopefully um, with some of these talks igniting interest in, in this logarithmic non-semi-simple TQFTs will have very nice set of rules, uh, say five years from now, a better understanding how they should work. Yeah, but in your paper, you also mentioned that some Fibonacci, so MTC was obtained and uh, in that case it is, uh, Non, it's not the not, not, uh, not same example. So what's the difference between that uh, this cases and the other cases? So in this case, it's uh, just the user MTC. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah so yeah, so this, yeah. this is much simpler. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's a little bit uh, right. So this I used as a simple example where it's, it's similar in a sense that from geometry, one can read off uh, the, the, this data and um, Actually, in this example, this is one nice illustration where if you know uh, matrix, matrix elements, for example, as zero lambda, you can reconstruct the rest of the S matrix because you know that it should satisfy the usual SL20 relations. But this, this uh, model or this simple example, although complete and beautiful and so on, it's a little misleading in a sense, or it's, it's, it's of a different flavor compared to logarithmic ones. So, because here indeed one gets the honest uh, SL20 representation, and there is no no, no non semi simplicity involved, no logarithmicity involved. Yeah. So, can you know the when we when we get uh, some non semi simple and when we obtain the semi simple cases? So, um, that's oh, that... then you could for sure it, and uh, you did some some clone branch, and uh, some in this way, so you can compute the, some S matrix and. Uh, can we know the, when this has a semi-simple or when this has not semi-simple? That, that's an excellent question. We tried to uh, make some comments uh, about this in a paper last year. I don't think we give a complete answer, but we try to answer analogous questions. For example, how many um, simple objects should we expect? Uh, what about their uh, projective covers and, and, and so on? So, um, right. we. Um, try to give some some uh, hints uh, or, or clues uh, from, from geometry what, uh, what one, one should expect, but I don't think we know the complete answer to this question. Okay. But, but there, is a, there, there is a discussion in, in, in this paper from last year. Yeah. But yeah, very, very good question. Yeah. I would expect that in general, um, if target space is non-compact, um, we should quite generically expect non-semi-simplicity, uh, but um, it would be nice to to understand this better. I mean, yeah, but in the, your case, in this case is the it seems that we have a semi-simple MTC. So. Yeah, so so this, this is yeah good example where it's probably not generic from uh, some whatever big perspective on this should be. It's uh, this target is also non-compact, but it happens to give in this case. Uh, 
it typically uh, gives also non-unitary CFT. So it, it still shows that something is wrong, uh, that, that usually either unitarity is violated or semi-simplicity is violated. But so I would expect that these are kind of properties that generically come out of uh, theories when target is non-compact. This uh, is unitary. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's it's Galois conjugate to uh, some non-unitary theories. So uh, th th this is another aspect, which again is much clearer in this case because there is no non-semi-simplicity. This is work from several years ago. And uh, one thing that puzzled me for a long time is uh, how uh, Galois conjugation in the world of tensor categories can be understood either physically or geometrically. So, um, uh, we managed to to understand this uh, in, in in this previous paper, and uh, uh, of course, Galois conjugation often relates uh, unitary and non-unitary theories. So. Yeah. Thank you. They all should be considered as part of the same package. Any other questions or comments? If no, let us thank uh, Professor Sergei Gukov one more time.